A Letter of Hieromonk Nikon of Optina to His Mother Christ is in our midst, dearest mother. I fervently desire for you peace and joy in the Lord, and I ask your holy prayers and mother's blessing. About myself, what can I write? I am alive and well. I have no particular needs. I receive everything I need. I labor a little as a secretary. I am very busy with various things in the monastery, or rather, things which touch in general on our common life. I sing on the cleros, and finally I serve, standing before the holy altar of God. As for my inward life, my cell and my soul, not everyone can know this. My cell is five yards long and three and a half wide, with one window. This cell is dearer to me than any sumptuous house or halls. As for the conditions of our common life, this is something which is complicated, but at the same time very simple. Complicated because it is difficult to put on paper what the former monastery is like now and everything that we are experiencing and doing, but simple, because except the Lord build the house, in vain do they labor that build it, in the words of the psalm. Yes, one must take the measures that are possible, prompted by common sense, which are not contrary to the Christian spirit and monastic life, but in taking them, one must expect success entirely from the hand of the Lord. Human pride says, we will do, we will attain, and we will build a tower of Babel. We demand of God an accounting for his actions. We desire to have the universe at our disposal. We dream of thrones beyond the clouds. But no one and nothing submits to us, and the powerlessness of man is demonstrated with all apparentness in bitter experience. Observing this experience in the history both of ancient long gone days and of recent times I have come to the conclusion that the ways of God's providence are past finding out for us we cannot understand them and therefore we must with all humility give, our, give ourselves over to the will of God then secondly no one and nothing can harm a man if he does not harm himself on the contrary if one does not avoid sin a thousand means of salvation will not help him. Consequently, the only evil is sin. Judas fell while in the presence of the Savior, but the righteous Lot was saved while living in Sodom. Such and similar thoughts come to me when I take instruction from the reading of the Holy Fathers and when I mentally glance upon my surroundings. What will happen? How will it happen? When will it happen? If such and such, such happens... Which way should one bend? If such and such happens, where can one find spiritual strength and consolation? O oh Lord, Lord! And a fierce perplexity takes hold of the soul when you wish to foresee everything in your mind, to penetrate into the mystery of the future, which is unknown but somehow frightful. The mind becomes exhausted, and the plans and methods it has devised are a childish fantasy. A pleasant dream. A man wakes up and everything has vanished, pushed away by harsh reality, and all one's plans are destroyed. Where is their hope? Our God is in our hope is in God. The Lord is my hope and my refuge. By giving over myself and everything to the will of God, the will of God will be done in me, and it is always good and perfect. If I am God's, then the Lord will defend and console me. If for my benefit some temptation is sent to me, blessed be the Lord who has arranged my salvation. Even in the midst of sorrows, the Lord is mighty to give great and most glorious consolation. Thus do I think, thus do I feel, thus do I observe and believe. From this, do not think that I have experienced many sorrows and trials. No, it seems to me that I have not really seen any sorrows yet. If I have gone through things which, at a superficial glance, seem to be something sorrowful, they have not yet caused me any great pain of heart, have not caused any sorrow, and therefore I would not call them sorrows. But I do not close my eyes to what is happening and to the future, so as to prepare my soul for redemption, so that I might say in the words of the psalm, I prepare myself 
and was not disturbed. I have told you that we had an investigation. They reviewed the business of our association. This investigation is not yet finished, and there has been no trial. When the trial will be and how it will end, God knows. But beyond any doubt, without the will of God, nothing can happen either to me in particular or to us all in general, and therefore I am calm. And when one soul is calm, what more can one seek? Now I have come from the all-night vigil, and am finishing this letter, which I began before the vigil. O oh Lord, what happiness, what marvelous words are proclaimed to us in church, peace and quiet, the spirit of sanctity and sensibility felt in church. The divine service ends, everyone goes to their homes, and I also come out of church. A wondrous night, a light frost, the moon with its silvery rays drenches our quiet little corner. I go to the graves of the reposed elders, bow down to them, ask their help in prayer, and for them I ask the Lord eternal blessedness in heaven. These graves say much to our mind and heart. From these cold inscriptions there is a breath of warmth. Before the mental gaze of my mind, there stand the wondrous image of reposed giants of the Spirit. During these days, I have remembered Father Barsanufius many times. I have remembered his words, the instruction which he gave me once, and perhaps more than once. He told me, The Apostle exhorts, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. And he continued, Look at what the same apostle says. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown. Yes, it is a great thing to keep, to preserve the faith. Therefore, I also tell you, examine yourselves whether you are in the faith. If you keep the faith, you can have a good hope over your lot. When the reposed elder told me all this, and he spoke well with enthusiasm, as far as I recall, it was in the evening by the quiet light of an icon lamp in his dear, cozy elder's cell. I felt that I, he was saying something wondrous, exalted, spiritual. My mind and heart seized on his words with eagerness. I had heard this utterance of the apostle before, but it had not produced in me such a response such an impression. It seemed to me that keeping the faith was something special. I believe, and I believe in the orthodox way. I have no doubt at all regarding faith, but here I felt that in this utterance there was something great, that indeed it is great, in spite of all temptations, all the experiences of life, all the offending things, to keep in one's heart the fire of holy faith, unquenched and unquenched even until death. For it is said, I have finished my course, that is, the whole of earthly life has already been lived, finished. The path which one had to travel has already been traveled. I am already at the boundary of earthly life. Beyond the grave another life already begins. The life which has been prepared for me by my faith which I have kept. I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. And my wondrous elder gave as his testament to me to test myself from time to time in the truth of the Orthodox faith, lest I might, unnoticed by myself, deviate from them. He advised me, among other things, to read the Orthodox Catechism of Metropolitan Philaret and to become acquainted with the confession of the Orthodox faith of the Eastern Patriarchs. Now, when the foundations of the Orthodox Russian Church have been shaken, I see how precious is this instruction of the Elder. Now, it seems, the time of testing has come to see whether we are in the faith. Now one must also know that the faith can be kept by one who believes warmly and sincerely to whom God is dearer than everything. And this latter can be true only in one who preserves himself from every sin, who preserves his moral life. O oh Lord, keep me in the faith by thy grace. 
The idea that the faith can be kept only with a good moral life is not my own. This is the teaching also of the Gospel and the Holy Fathers. Here is what it says in the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Light is come into the world, and man loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. <clears throat> Christ here calls himself the light. He tries to persuade the Jews of his time to abandon the search for honor from each other, while doing which a man is incapable of faith. But they only mocked. How can ye believe which receive honor one from another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? And Bishop Ignatius Branchininov, indicating these words of the gospel, says that, like other passions, the passion of vainglory annihilates faith in the human heart. Like them, it makes the human heart incapable of faith in Christ, of confessing Christ. Therefore, I fervently entreat your holy prayers, that the Lord might preserve me from every evil, that is, from sin in all its forms, and then no outward situation will be able to harm me. I only wish to tell you briefly that I am alive and well, and beyond my intentions I was drawn into writing this. In writing this letter I have scarcely been able to follow my thoughts and record what they have dictated to me. All this has somehow involuntarily poured out of my pen, and it represents my profound conviction. May the Lord preserve us all. I ask the holy prayers of all, and I myself, according to my own infirm powers, will always remember everyone in prayer. Forgive me. May the grace of our Lord and God Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.